and it broke out my disc. So that is why we are like tackling the issue before this uh, presentation. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that I see so many people join the, the the this lecture. And and today I just want to share like what is the current application we use in OpenGL Hub for tackling uh, data data management and also some of the uh, process in Python because I also create like like very easy script. Since I threw out all of the section, I know everyone is advanced in programming also like remote sensing, maybe some um, more like better than me a lot. But yeah, anyway, we would like to share some of our um, story in OpenGeoHub and also this kind of um, flooring, what we are actually doing is kind of global scale uh, re uh, earth observation remote sensing work. So I first have to introduce myself. I am um, Yu Feng. I'm from Taiwan. I currently uh, uh, research assistant in OpenGL, mainly for the technical technical side for to, for do the hardware and so uh, also back end computing this kind of work. And as topic, we are gonna talk about some data management strategy. So so we have an outline today. First, we're gonna start from the very basic. What is raster and factor data? Yeah, it's except probably for me because I came from the other domain into uh, GIS and uh, geo, geo information. So this is like my first things I think people should know before uh, entering any kind of uh, 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 geo operation. And second, we will talk about uh, analyze ready data. This kind of data set which allow uh, user to share and to run, run model to, to do analyze, to actually uh, circulate the, the whole research or like whole um, decision-making stuff. And then we will talk a little bit about uh, cloud optimized format. And then we will jump into some data manipula manipulations. It will be like a simple short practice, but it will be the interesting practice. And also after that, we will go through our scripting. So we we're talking about how what is scripting and how can you do for production work. And yep. So first, I think probably I can skip the part, but I will just briefly say uh, what is raster and and factor. That's um, that's what is say up there. So raster is actually it's based on the the grid, and each cell contain a value, and like the, which is more commonly using remote sensing data. And for the factor data, they have um, it's it is about points, lines, and polygons, and it's quite commonly used like uh, Google Google Map things. So you basically you you want to find a restaurant, you want to find which kind of municipality you're in, you will use this kind of factor data to 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 actually extract the information. So also this kind of data formats in 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 the real world. So it's look like the down 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 there just kind of uh, uh, images, and for the factor data, the rest of the most different is like factor is like a table, so and uh, the raster is more it's it's a matrix type mat matrix like, so this is the the main different. And for the factor data, you can always append new information into like the into the data set to actually gain more information for to to abundance the whole data set. And then for the raster data, they have the a strictly a line of the cell. Like you can build a data cube and you can run machine learning model based on this the data cube. And in the Earth observation, so for example, like raster data, we will use uh, in cellized imagery, remote sensing indexes like NDVI or TWI, this kind of matrix in data indices, and also digital elevation models is suitable for uh, sortage in this kind of data format. And for the factor data, we would normally use like institute data, like soil sample or lidar data, and also in the spatial data set. And also in this um, summer school, I also learned about mobility data set from uh, Anin Aninta. So. It's quite new for me, 
and I feel like, yeah, this is quite into like factor data, this kind of uh, format, if I'm not made it wrong. Um, yeah, so uh, we went through like our, uh, with very well, like the introduction very quick. And we now talk about for the earth, for the earth's observation, what is the, the current situation right now? So you can see, uh, today we have so many stories of earth observation data. We have Landsat, we have Sentinel, we have Modis, and we even have like the commercial commercial, commercial uh, products, Planescope, which is have sort tons of like terabyte, petabyte of data, just the imagery, like time series, spatial imagery. However, most of part of the data is not very, it's not easy to use directly. For example, for Sentinel data, like uh, uh, Merce Richard, he, he, he said, uh, it's a lot of things to deal with how to you, you process the Sentinel data from the data hub to the, actually the, the uses. So that is why it's important, like we understand how should we process the whole data in order to do, to run our model, to do analysis. So you have some main um, obstacle in our, uh, in our Earth observation data is for example, the cloud they will block the re, uh, research reflectance back to the back to the sky. So they will create this kind of uh, artifact in the imagery. If you wanted to run into uh, modeling, if you calculate like mean, this this cloud would really like mess up your 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 descriptive descriptive statistic. And also, in for example, in cell uh, in Landsat satellites, so, so Landsat five, seven, eight. Five, many five and seven, there's kind of transaction periods. The data is not actually harmonizing amount the even amount in the same satellite. So if you look at the cell and uh, lens at five and lens at seven, you will see like the, the same band of red red band or uh, infant red band. This actually have different the value is not quite consistent. So even that you, you use the same satellites, you still have to harmonize between amongst different device. And the last point, the data is normally huge and not easy to retrieve and to get the, the air, our interest, our area of interest. I remember when I first started to deal with the Landsat data as an amateur, just wanted to play by myself. I really wanted to attract the area or my home country, Taiwan, and I have to load three images, and it's already crossed my, it already crossed my poor uh, workstation. And I just want to get the image, and I feel I still have some overlap. And how can I deal with that overlap? Overlap, and after deal with that overlap, I need to crop this kind of um, the the area that I'm interested in, and really take a lot of work if you don't have uh, uh, like the enough shortage for the data, even for the the process, the RAM for the process. So, yeah, Earth observation data nowadays, yeah, it's a lot of data, but it's also a lot of work to make it work. And also factor data, it's not, has no exception. For example, light up point, uh, point cloud, which is actually stores like 3D information about the XY location and also like they, they can construct the, the, they can construct tree, tree, uh, tree canopy, and also they they can have the three D information, which is kind of a exp expanded format for of uh, factor data, which contains also huge amount of data set. So yeah, if you want to play with, for example, Jedi point, you have to download all of the data, and if you're only interested in small part, and you still have to to download the data to get. The part, the time series of the of the area of your interest in, and which is not quite quite easy for for a normal user to to process that. Um, yeah. So this paper, I uh, I showed one of the paper here is from Fagerman, and he talked about the the big Earth data modern, modern ch challenges. So the, the top five challenges were related to, for example, finding the right data set, access the data set, and interoperating the data set. So the first thing you have to find, where should I download the data, which kind of version I need, 
and how should I down how can I download the data and and extract the, the, the area which is I which which I'm interested in. And then how can I interact with the data? It's like big is my RAM big enough to deal with the data set or not? How can we do? So that is why we come into ideas called analyze ready data. I think how does anyone heard about analyze, analyze ready data here? Yeah, uh, most of them uh, heard about that. Yeah, it's quite very trendy in Earth observation. Before I joined this kind of uh, domain, I don't know what is analyzed ready data. The data is all analyzed ready. Just have to clean the data. In, in our domains, you just have to clean the data, and you your, your data is ready. But yeah, clean the data in Earth Earth observation is not that easy. So. <laughs> We, you, for the raw data, it's actually big enough number of data. You have to extract the extract the data, and you have to remove the artifact. For example, we saw we said about the cloud, and sometimes you have to do the correction, like atmosphere atmosphere correction, and sometimes you have to change the format in order to align with different formats so you can read it together. And since you get the analyzed ready data, like you can come to do things. So you can direct it, go to informant decision making. So like the policy maker, they can just use this kind of uh, analysis ready data, can assess the data. They can do the anal analyze for themselves by directly uh, ob observing that. Or you can go through another path through this kind of uh, GIS expert or like machine learning data scientists to actually extract the information from data or transform the information from the data to through like machine learning or feature engineering to get the, the models like environmental model and this kind of model have tell some information we cannot find from our raw data which is for example like the our, our hackathon how can we know the distribution of the ticks if you just look at the the the, the climate the the, the the climate uh, the climate layer or like the DEM layer you don't know where is the hotspot for a tick because a lot of different uh in different factors in impact of where the ticks will be so this is why this kind of work is very important to to actually help us to understand uh, how the the ecosystem works and so at the end they will all go through uh infor informal decision making to actually take action. I think this this part is, uh, for me, it's what we are lack or what we lack of, but it's super important to actually make our, uh, make our work valuable because you have to actually take action. If you see some, for example, wildfire, you see some disease spreading and this kind of action, it's needed to, 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 be, to, to be taken and it's, very upon of what we can do to help them to make this kind of uh, make some common uh, decision. Um, so far, everyone have some questions. Yep. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, just the uh, conceptual uh, stuff. So analyze ready data list idea. I would just uh, emphasize like uh, like USGS the the Landsat NS the Landsat NS ready data already host by them. They are. They are tied, uh, tailed it, geo register, and they are top of atmosphere and atmospherically corrected product. And in they are stored in the common projection so that everything is in line. You have the clear um, metadata to use that data set. Okay. And talk about LMS correction. This is just one of the example how we correct the data if we don't have the knowledge. So basically, uh, I simplify this because I also not in this domain. But when I first come to uh, Landsat level one and level two, I found this, this stuff. So basically the solar, radi uh, solar radiation, they come to the surface and surface reflect this kind of light back to the satellite. So we can actually get the uh, surface reflectant by the sun got to the front, got to the ground and to the satellite. And we ignore like, I, I in, originally I can ignore the atmosphere have that have this kind of app, uh, impact and I found out like really there will be some impact on uh, different like uh, light wave they were uh, absorbed and scatter the light when it go through the the atmosphere so that is why uh, we have uh, Landsat level two data to actually 
um, used. I think they use the 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 one of the model is it's, it's a model to correct this kind of uh, uh, this kind of disturbance in my in our atmosphere. And you can see on the right, like, uh, do anyone know NDVIS, right? Oh yeah, okay. uh, yeah. So you can see the the right side, the bottom of atmosphere and top of the atmosphere. They have actually not quite not hack, uh, not really correlated. The NDVI without atmospheric correction will be actually underestimated, which is the case. So that is why analyst ready is important. And for 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 the end user, we only see like the re, uh, the reflectant, but you don't we don't see this. We don't see like it should do like error correction before we're using this data set if we don't know. So yeah. And that's that is the part of the analyst rate data. So this anyone have the question about that and want to start a discussion? So it's, it's all okay. Yeah. No? Yeah. Um apart from that, uh, we will I would like to introduce uh the cloud solution for um for our raster data, uh, which is called Cloud Optimized GeoTeef. So what is Cloud Optimized GeoTeef? Uh, anyone have like idea about Cloud Optimized GeoT or they are your guy currently using? Yeah? Yeah. Or it's, okay, it's not too many people gonna have, have used this format, but I would like to introduce. So uh, yeah, I will introduce in the amazing work. So actually the clock, the, the clock it's, a, it's a tail the GeoTeef which has the, the spec, uh, specific order of data and metadata. And it supports of like if, if efficient HTTP range regress. So basically it's like a cloud solution, but, but it stores the, the data on the cloud. And you when you assess the data, you don't have to like read the whole data set. You just based on the metadata and you can filter out the non-necessary uh, data within, for example, the bonding box to extract the data what you only need. So, for example, you have now you have the global map, and you only need it to just give it your, where where you are located in, and it will extract very fast because you don't have to read the whole global data set. It's only read it like what you request to HTTP. Um, yeah, and some uh, visualization here. It's not. In cloud optimized GOT, they also have one of the the gray structures here, the 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 pyramid structure. So basically, the pyramid structure they allow you to have an an overview on your own data set. So you can open the whole global like thirty minute high resolution map in your QGIS within seconds. So how how can how how can it manage? Like how can you read like a uh, hundred gigabyte of data into QGIS in seconds? So that is the trick. Actually, they create a, a pyramid, a pyramid structure that say actually uh, resemble different layers. So the the down there, the max level is like the the finer resolution, and built upon that level three, level two, level one, they are actually resemble it to the coarse resolution. So you have like very high resolution, for example, 30 meter, but you host like coarser resolution, 100 meter, uh, one kilometer or two kilometer or five kilometers. Like this, this kind of uh, data set, rethink this uh, cock teeth file, cock, cock file in, in, within the cock file. So actually when you're reading the, when you're reading the 100 meter, 100 gigabytes of 30 meter uh, global map, you only reading the the coarsest resolution map, so that is why you can read in a second because the coarse resolution actually just had like few hundred of pixel for the global map, so you're just reading the the coarse resolution when you zoom in and they will actually send a request to the cloud service to show that I want to zoom in in this small area, and when you zoom in and they send a request and it just extract the data within that sort within that short small area. And it will be fast because it will just change the overview to the to the finer overview. 
And if you zoom in again, you will change to the finer overview and until you reach the ground. So it will be the finest overview that you can reach. Um, that is a trick. Um, it is actually built by the, the club objects shortage. It's not like the, the basic uh, fail function we are working on, but yeah. So I want to talk in this slide is about uh, the Amazon F3 and Google Cloud shortage. They actually adopt, oh, okay, question. Uh, yeah. Can you choose which resolution you want for it to that extent? Yeah. Is, is they, they, where they're this yeah, when you try to build the, the cock, you can choose like how many level you want. So you can choose. Yeah, you can maybe not, it could, could be not that resolution, uh, define the resolution, but define the, 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 how many level of the overview? So if it, for example, you devil divine 10 level of overview, so you will have more map shortage shortage in one cock. And if you define by three overview and then only three maps shortage in the cock, and it will be slow uh, more it will be slower if you read only three uh, three overview because the, the course's resolution might be not that coarse. And for the night uh, map, you might load faster, but you have you need more shortage to store like nine layers of map. So it's work on that, work, work like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, that's no good. So I will just try to show like how can we open that, this kind of map using QGIS. So if you have, okay, I can just demo here. So basically I can, I can, who, oh, I would I show also the screen if I, go to my QGIS. So I actually have a URL here. It's actually a Alice uh, D D M. So it's a 30 meter global, global, it's a 30 meter global map. And we can just have this kind of URL here. And let's take a risk to open on our QGIS. It's like a 100 meter, a 30 meter resolution for the global. So here I can add layer. You guys can see. Really? I didn't. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So we can see now here. I can read from the protocol HTTP, which is the cloud service. So I reading the map. I join. Oh, it's like oh, it's ensemble DEM. Yeah. But yeah. So now yeah, I'm reading the global 30 meter. It doesn't look like 30 meter from here, but if you zoom in, uh, yeah. because the, the server is kind of far from uh, far from Europe. So I think that is why it's slow. So if you zoom in, you can have the, the map. Okay, you can zoom in too fast. The, the Wi-Fi speed is not too fast. Still reading. Yeah. So yeah, you can see the resolution change while I zoom in. So when I zoom in more, okay, the resolution didn't change that much. But you can see the resolution really change according to how big the size I, I log in the data. Maybe I can just keep it here. Okay, I let it rest a bit. Oh cool. Uh, share back to my slide. If you, anyone have the slide here, you can also play with the data set. I think if anyone have a laptop, they can also open the, the link throughout your QGIS to see like how cloud optimized GOT works. So we'll come back. Yep. So, yep, that's cool. Um, Let's keep going. What? So uh, now we have this environmental 30 meter DM load in UGS. Yep. <laughs> now, how do I use an analysis? Yeah, that is a good question. So basically, you're loading the whole QGIS, <laughs> you're loading the whole uh, DM to your QGIS. What, what depends on what kind of analysis you want to do. If you wanted to reach project the whole uh, 30 meter QGIS, if you're 30 meter global DEM, 
you will still crush your, your workstation. So you will not like to do that. But you will like to do is for some user, they only interesting in some small area. So for example, you're in the Netherlands, you want to see if the sea level rise really happen. You want to have the, the, the global DEM. I have to like DEM for the model and you don't know where to find. You, have, you, you spot this global DEM and you can just zoom into the Netherlands and then you crop that small extent. But at this point, it's like you can really check without download it because you don't have to download the global DEM and then check because download also take you to like 150 gigabytes, maybe take you 10 minutes to download. And maybe you have to take time to figure out how can I uh, read the data. But with things, you just, you just copy and pass the URL on your QGIS and you zoom into the area which, is your, which you're interested in and you crop that uh, small extent and you can do analyze from there. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. So uh, the cloud optimized geo, geo, uh, geo teeth actually adopt by USGIS say that and goes to so Google Cloud and AWS. They have uh, this kind of uh, introduction also about how, what is the cloud optimized geo teeth. If you have the, the slide, you can um, use the link to check how they describe or how wonderful is uh, cloud optimized geo teeth is. So, yeah. And um, based on two ideas, which is like, okay, and I analyze ready data, cloud optimized GOT, and we boom together and a new uh a new agonops pop up so it called Arco. Man. Arco. Arco is actually stand for uh, analyze ready cloud optimized pop. It's a, it's a paper from Stern's published in 2022, and which uh elaborate like what how uh this kind of Article really help for uh, research because it should be it should be a complete, consistent, current, and correct. And based on this kind of uh, conceptual idea, we we build our core data for the user can actually extract the complete data set at least ninety nine percent of the pixel of, of interest. Also consistent of file name and variables name and relations of the document, which is. Um, recording them uh, matter data. I don't know if anyone here like really have to deal with the file name issue. Like the file file name is not consistent. So you uh, you cannot assess your legacy data and like you have to deal with like the renaming stuff all the time. No. Yeah, it's like, it's a pain, no? Mm -hmm. It's a pain you, if you don't have the consistent file, file name uh, naming convention and, and especially on the cloud. You have to actually uh, move it to to create a new file with the to create on the cloud that the um, the file name change, but it, you have to uh, revise all the data set to, to create that. And so that is like what the idea is so important. You have to you need a consistent file names, and also it should be current, like most up to date version. And also it's it's also important to have like different version version recorded by. Uh, what's how what's the process you you produce the map? But yep, and the last things it's it should be correct. It's from the research uh, integrity. Like as a, as a researcher, you should provide your data, which is less as as small uh, correct and high possible uh, quality as you can. Yeah, it's a strong ambition. Um, and I will I, I finish like the the cloud optimize. Cloud optimize uh, solution for raster data. So and I have a question about raster, and then I will join. I will just jump into the factor data. So anyone else still have the question about the fact uh, raster, uh, raster cloud optimized stuff? No. Uh, I have a bit of a question. Will, yeah. um, what's the difference, or what is better? Is it better to use SAR or uh, cloud optimize uh, geotiffs? The the SAR. Yeah. Do you know SAR? The yeah. Because like, I think it's a bit like it goes in the same idea of like things on, um, yeah, on, on chunks, so you don't need to access the data all at once. But yeah, if you knew anything about that, yeah, I I have I did not work too much with Zar. So basically, Zar, you uh, I mean, it's more for uh the 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 programmer or more for like the the QGIS user. I mean, for uh, cloud optimized GLTs, I would say that it's a breach for. 
uh, programmer to to the like the GIS G, G, QGIS or GIS software user. So I don't know Zar is you can also like very inter integrate to 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 GIS to QGIS program easily. It's well, like, uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would say it's more difficult for them. It's more like the equivalent of NetCDF. Yeah. Um, and also cloud. that's bring the very good discussion about what is our tar target audience for our yeah. format. And if it's for the researcher, um, you will have like more, more efficient way than this one. But it's for like the, the end user, like the policy maker, they will want to assess the data. They only have the experience yeah. only in the QGI, in GIS software. And that will be the solution Please. for for them. Yeah. yeah. So that's a different. Okay. So let's jump into uh, factor data. So before uh, factor data, I want to talk about uh, spatial indexing because I, I received some uh, complaint and I didn't expect uh, explain spatial indexing before, and it's hard to understand. So spatial indexing is here. Is we have a R three. Um, Illustration here, and the exception index is you say that it's an extended ex index according to a special columns like the geometry. And we have this kind uh, of R tree, quarter tree, or KD tree. And I have an example here for special indexing in, in R tree. So, what is the special indexing? It's like the, the main purpose is to let the user like find the data inside a big data chunk easily. So the main um, um, method is to go to go through a tree. So the tree is like first you can imagine like the data is the, is a it's a huge huge C a oh, huge C and but we're talking about tree but it's like a huge chunk of data they have like a, a well extend or current so for example global scale and you have this kind of uh, polygon inside the the global. So it's like this kind of this this kind of rectangle. You can imagine it's a polygon. And how do, what is the efficient way to to build the hierarchy of the of this kind of small polygon? Is to build like min, the minimum bounding blocks for the polygons. So you can see, for example, uh, uh, let's let, let's talk about like the the left um, top. The R nine, R ten, R eight, and for these three, um, for these three small, small polygon, the minimum bounding box is R three. Yeah, it's clear, right? So, <laughs> and if you see like the minimum for R three, and the right side, uh, I I think I have the ping right. So, is it work? So like, this okay, cool. So R three over here. Which has the first layer R nine, R ten, R eight, which have the minimum bonding box to R three, and then for R three to R four, you have the minimum bonding box of uh, R one. Yeah, I think it's here. No. <laughs> yeah, maybe bigger because they have they include that R bonding box anyway. So the idea is like they build uh, the hierarchy based on the small polygon. And they could create the minimum uh, bonding box for the higher um, hierarchy. I just like what do you see the coding? But it's more complicated because the polygon is not it's not like a, the grid system. So the small polygon they can they can um, actually be within the the minimum uh, bonding box. And instead, a different minimum bonding box or can be also can be within a bigger minimum bonding box. Yeah, sorry, ah, I talked too much. And to, to be within the, the bigger minimum bounding box, and you based on that, you can build like a, a, a minimum second level minimum bounding box based on the, the third level minimum bounding box and until like every uh, polygon have, has been included, have been included. So how do you extract the data? It's like you see it about, you, you have a subtest in that six? And you you start from the first bonding box. Okay, it's R one, and the second uh, second minimum bonding bonding box is R five, and the, the 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 second level of bonding box is R R ten, and then you just need to okay see one metadata, second metadata, the third metadata, and the fourth metadata until uh, you find your your 
your your your polygon inside which like bounding box. So they create a like the, like a tree structure to first from the top to find to to build the, the tree to find the 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 other uh, destination for for that uh, polygon and go through the, the the lower level until you find your your bounding box. So that will be super fast in my in in, in this sense. Uh, anyone have the question about special indexing? Um, I hope I explain it clear. It's like a plain language. Uh, oh, okay. So, what is the uh, optimal cloud uh, solution for factor data? So, as uh, I have, I put, I put the question mark here. <laughs> I still don't know because there are still some debates. Uh, a bit debate in the community what is the best format to the to the factor data, but we have that some candidates like flood geo buff on the right side and geo park here at the uh, left side. So we first come to uh, flat geo buff. So flat geo buff is a format that's like already uh, integrated to, and you've already developed for uh, such a long time. They have complete feature and they have no size limits to write in the data or read out the data. So it's different from the shapefile and uh, geo package and geo JSON. Is anyone still using shapefile here? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Cool. Uh, how do you guys deal with like the, a lot of uh, different files? I'm I'm curious how to actually uh, sortage the file. I always like lose one of the file and like <laughs> I got kind of open my shape file. So where's my file? <laughs> and yeah. And you have the features only one file inside one uh, inst to sort all of the factor data. I think it could be better than shapefile, huh? Yeah, and and also that for 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 uh, FabGeoBuff we have what do we do I say special indexing? Yeah, so basically you can open uh, FabGeoBuff if you have like a certain uh, um, bonding box like small bonding box, they will just do a special indexing and find out which kind of factor data allocate inside this bonding box and extract the, the data just right inside or like inter intersect with the bonding box, inside or interact intersect with the bonding box. Um, yeah, that is for Geo, but it's amazing. But the, the, com, the, the, the drawback is like the IO time for developer, I still feel it's slow with building the, the large data set. So it's still pretty low if you wanted to make the layer data inside flood, into flood geo buff from H5 from the flat group. And it will take you or so eight hours to, to store to like 100 gigabytes of data. It's still because they have to build like special indexing inside the, the data set, which is, which is require a lot of computation power. And also they, are, they have no compression. Yeah, no compression at that sense. So the file will be uh, similar to ge 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 pack ge pack package or GeoJSON, but it's too 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 huge. So that is why another type of the format comes in. It's called uh, GeoParket. Does anyone already heard about GeoParket? Yeah, cool, 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 cool. So I don't. I see like most of the people don't familiar with the format, but the format is. I would say it's trended. It will be the next uh, factor, da factor data format to to the um, uh, to geospatial uh, community. I would say the, they have like a uh, some feature like appendable <clears throat> because it's you normally based on the the uh, the the columns the the cloud for the the column clock uh, a column indexing. So it can easily to just uh, extract by column, like you you name like which kind of column you want to extract. For example, you have like a solar sample, you have uh, solar carbon, uh, solar carbons, you have uh, pH, you have for example uh, record date, and if you don't just interesting in the solar carbon, you just like define. I wanted just to 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 just read solar carbon data. And you will just read the that column, and you don't read another column. Well, we will speed speed up your reading speed. And also, one of the 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 advantage is it is quite it is very it is very highly uh compressed compared with the flat geo buff. 
Um, yeah, I think Tom sent me uh, uh, an article about GeoParket today. I mean, uh, maybe we have time, we can check it out. I mean, oh, where is the, the Zoom? Oh, here. Uh, yeah, um, it's risky to, to check the, uh, okay, I should open that first. So basically, uh, it's talking about how one uh, how wonderful geo geo pocket is. Okay, let me open this. Yeah, this kind of article. So it's a uh, more and more organizations are actually right now adapt to uh, geo pockets for their uh, factor data, and here it shows that the 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 reading formats the function. And the main concern is about the the time. So as I say, they are the the data set is actually highly compressed, and it's actually optimized for data transfer and data and and I O. And which is very important for the recent data sci data uh, science to actually share the data and also like process the data in a ultimate ultimate automatic way, and the, which is very um, useful for uh, even like low down your shortage costs and low down your uh, co computation. No, probably not low down your computation, though, but mainly your shortage costs. You can imagine it's like the flat geo buff and geo parquet. I test it out. It's about, sometimes it's about uh, 10 times smaller and it's like 10 times faster to, to, re, um, to re and build. But the comp is like, it's still poor uh, integration in Q in GIS, uh, I I read some articles. They talk about it's already integrated in three point two eight. It's a new the newest version of GIS QGIS, but I still have difficulty to reading the the geo parquets inside in, inside the 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 QGIS. Does did anyone have tried it before using uh, QGIS to read to reading geo parquets? Mm. No. Okay. Uh, I will keep trying. <laughs> And the 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 other disadvantage is the uh, is probably it, it, I would say that it was a trade off. It's like they don't have uh, special indexes built in in inside the uh the geo uh, the parquet. But it's also an article they discuss about they they raise the issue in the geo parquet. They ask me well, why could you build like a special index in geo parquet? And I see I saw the the developer. He answered like, okay, if you wanted to build a special index, you will actually create the the one of like the the data format which is require a lot of space and which is not a building for for them, so they will not build special indexing. So that's actually makes sense. So you think about that. If you wanted to have a special index, you definitely have to store more data to, and if you have a lot of polygon, you will have a very huge tree. So it requires a lot of shortage space to actually create uh, a, fa uh, a special indexing factor data. But if you wanted to store your data efficiently, you would not, you would not create uh, a, special in a special index inside the, inside the format. So that will faster for you to, to extract the data. So that's actually makes sense. So think about if you wanted to have more faster to read and more faster to open, and you have to do more work in advance. And if you want to just like the more efficient way, like the the, the, the programmer just know how to deal with the data and you store it in geo parquet. So and also they have a discussion to if you don't they, they because there's no special indexing in geo parquet, you can still build like an external R tree based on the file name to build your own R tree. So it's also so so doable to to build this by by yourself by the, the by your uh, shortage system. So I just like example for like special index. So you can see like you just move the, the bounding box and it's only retrieve this data according to the bounding box and pretty fast. That is how um, this kind of special indexing work. Yep. I should show this slide. Yep. And um, just give the, like the aligning. Google Map is also the cloud surface. So you will see from the beginning, you can't see everything and you zoom in and you find more feature, even like the factors data and even like the, the terrace. 
uh, features, like this kind of things. You are for for the for the raster and the, for the factor, like Google Maps, they do the a great job thing to like cloud surface. This it is like yeah, I don't know how how many years they already uh, adopt this system, but yeah, yeah, this one. Oh no no no, okay, sorry. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you. Yep. All right. So. Ooh. So what is, do you have any question about like cloud, cloud service? Huh, Faye? So um, you, you, you just present like these two final formats. Mm. Uh, there are also quite some others such as Post GIS. Yep. And files, David. Yeah. Files. PM um, down. Why did you choose these two? Yeah, PM tell is actually also great. I didn't I didn't put in put in on because I, I haven't taxed it yet. But uh, yeah, the the guy uh, Portal Map, yeah, you you met him? Oh, yeah, yeah. He also developed this kind of the the telling uh, factor data, which is also very efficient. But I didn't bring it up. But it's a good point. We should I should also put PM tell inside this. They try to build a cloud optimized format for the open source community. Yeah, and. Yeah, he visited once in Open Geo Hub, I think last year, and and I remember like he's a Taiwanese guy, and I thought that yeah he's a he's a Taiwanese guy, and I just like speak Mandarin to him, but after like two minutes, three minutes, he he say that I'm Taiwanese, but I actually live in U.S. for his whole life, so it's okay. We just speak it, just speak switch back to English then. And I was like embarrassed myself. I met like, okay, we are from the same place, but oh, you speak English. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. We we finished our like conceptual uh uh this kind of former stuff or this kind of the basic introduction. I I I think that would not overwhelm you. Is is anyone have like um uh, uh, if need some time to pro process? Uh, you can read, you can read, and you can ask me the question if you want after this this uh, section. Um, yeah, let's talk about some uh, geospatial data manipulation in Python. So I I categorize into three part of this kind of package that we use commonly used in 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 Open Geo Hub to deal with. Uh, um, geospatial data or the data manipulation machine learning. You normally use NumPy, uh, pandas for machine learning, scikit-learn, and for the special data processing, uh, we already have re already have a lot of lectures about raster IO, Shapely, um, raster IO for raster data, Shapely, um, geo pandas for uh, vector data uh, input output, and some field, some data visualization tool, which is quite common, it's like uh, Seaborn and uh, Matplotlib, and in in Open Geo Hub, we actually uh, quite primarily we develop like the workflow for ourselves, but it's called uh, Psyche Map because we mainly we do a lot of work in machine learning. So we wrap up or some function to to actually do some um, to actually skip up some of the line. Like we have to write a lot of line to get the result we want, but we just wrap up into one package and we now develop it. But I also have the story when we developed this uh, package. It used to be. I used to be our manager, Leandro, and he developed this package, package called EU Map under the EU, EU project. And I asked him why why it's called EU Map. It's only can use it in EU now. It's like the world map, but it's the it's a it's a bad name. So we rebranded it into Psyche Map. It's more like a Psyche Learn for map. So I hope that they will they will get trended. It's like people will actually use it. It's not it's not the non-EU cannot use EU map. So we rebranded it. And now we're also uh, creating some gate fielding methods for 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 satellite imagery. And we run used to, we used to run in Python and would now we switch to C to, to speed out our process. Um yeah. How, how many times I have still? But I can probably do like this kind of handout uh, exercise. And if you have the laptop, you can follow. And you don't have, I will show you like the way, like I prepare this. Like I don't, I don't know at the beginning like people will be that offense. So I prepare like a very simple, uh, very simple uh, 
uh, collab, like to show how is the raster and factor data works. So, yep, and I still play with that. Okay. So, mm -mm -mm. can you see this? Can you see it from the screen? Yes. Nope. Uh, this is still there. See, see this one? No, yeah. And then we just. Yeah. So, if you anyone want to play with that, you can play. If you don't want, you can see like what I'm trying to do in this. A tutorial and that's fine and if you have any any question with uh, how did i do it you can just stop me so um, yeah let's go okay so yeah the section is mainly about the introduction to geo uh geospatial data in python so we use raster io numpy and geopandas to deal with like, the number of cast no i first uh i reading the package so we're reading some of the package we will use, and I will show you a bit about like borrow nets for for more efficient computing, and also our mm, yeah I don't and also our psyche map to do like how do we how do how can we wrap up the function into one? We don't have to write that much more code probably in my in my uh, practice, so. Oh, so here I have the data format called alert. So that's uh, also reading this. So, so everyone here familiar with Python, or someone for me more familiar with with R, uh, as Python. If you don't familiar with Python, that's okay because it's easy. You still can understand what is going on because it's a it's an easy script. So I read in the data. Like I read, I reading here is the alert alert data, and I don't know what is the alert about. Oh, I showed it here. So, oh, it's actually uh, Godzilla. So I just received this alert from I don't know which data. Oh, the CIA, CIA, CIA. He they are located out the the Godzilla, and then yeah, it's a it's a case. I think it's for the practice. Like we are. Actually, have to talk about this kind of work. Um, we have the CIA who send us the Gazelle location and want want us to locate them for them. So what we're gonna have to do? We just have the image and the geolocation. The first thing we we are going to do is we know we are going to do. If you only have the picture and you don't have the geolocation, what you gotta to do? Yeah. It's actually uh, geolocated by ourselves. So, uh, yeah, they have the geolocation from altitude to longitude and at the coordinates in EPSG. So, let's locate our Godzilla. Mm. Um, when we locate our, our, our uh, uh, images, we can see from the Google Colab we have this. Raster, raster data, and we can download it. And, oh, I need to switch the. And because we only know what is the geolocation of our Godzilla, we don't know what exactly where is it. So we open in QGIS. Uh, I need to switch. I need to switch back and forth a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So the main the main thing we're gonna have to do is to open on QGIS, and then we can possibly uh, reading some base map. Okay, it's hiding the gazelle. So I don't know where is it, but let's check it out. So we zoom out, zoom out. Okay, actually, gazelle is somewhere close to the land. It's Noru. It's Noru. Uh, I think Noru is at the Pacific Ocean, right? So, oh yeah, 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 it's here. So, now oh, it's crash, it's crashing. So, who know where's more Noru is? No, no, no way. I mean, there's our allies. There are only like the the left, uh, twelve country who recognize Taiwan and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So basically, our, our Godzilla is located here. So please don't compare with the 
the size of the city, the Godzilla itself is very small, but you know, Godzilla is devastating if you come to the coast and you destroy the building. And I think like the people will not survive that easy. Yeah, but mainly Godzilla is quite friendly, you know. It's mainly like humans try to um try to uh, irrigate Godzilla and Godzilla like destroy anything. So we also have to take very clear for about where is the Godzilla and how how is there the habitat of a Godzilla. So to be to be sure that we are not uh interpreted it. So let me share it back to our code. So now we have the 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 position of the Godzilla, and we can read it out to check that if if you read the raster, it's okay. So we we read we read the raster back. Okay, it's it's still the Godzilla. It isn't it haven't been twisted or something else because we're reading the the same projection system in the same code in uh, in same the same profile in in raster I O. Okay, that's data remain the same, and after an hour, we receive another geolocation was given at altitude a different altitude and. And then we can update our new location for our Godzilla. Okay, it's quite pretty easy. So basically, we just change the geolocation to a new one, so we can know we can know where is our Godzilla right now. So let's take a look. I would just upload it, and we do the same thing to to create the the another raster data. And then, and then let me. Yep, there's new raster data here and down, download it and open on QGIS. Okay. I think the main obstacle is I need to switch the zoom back and forth. Uh, okay. 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 I hope I can spot the Argozilla. So where's our, oh, there's our, our raster one. Where is it? Oh, here. Oh, so can you guys see? So basically, an hour ago, Godzilla was here, and a new Godzilla. It's actually uh, it's too small. Sorry, I gotta make it bigger. Mm. Okay. So the former location, it's close to Nauru. It's quite dangerous if the Godzilla really get on the coast and destroy stuff. But things like the Godzilla is moving the somewhere else. Okay, okay. it can be safe. Yep. Okay, cool. So what next? What next should we talk with our uh, lovely creature? Yeah. Does anyone don't know what is uh, Godzilla is? Oh, okay, everyone know what is uh, what is Godzilla? Because I don't know, it's like a Japanese thing or like a global thing. All right, okay, that's this one. So we have our geolocation of our Godzilla, and yeah, you can check with your QGIS for sure. So yeah, that's just for my basic raster raster data manipulation. So we're reading the data, we see what it is, and we're sorting the geolocation. We get the we got where is our Godzilla is, and now we're playing with some factor data, and you can use shapely geom geometry to create the factor point, and also from the point you can create, like you can use buffer to create the um, the, the the polygon based on our points, and also you can also draw the line and make the polygon by three line you can make the triangle. Yes, four line you can make the. Uh, uh, like, what is the four line in it? Multi, multi a polygon. Okay, that's all. So we can read in like here some a polygon here, and we'll go. So we can create like a geo data frame to to store it to the geo data format, and to see. And also we can put in in the uh, geometric uh, geo JSON. Okay, so we are save a new file, which is like we we reading some point. And we can also save them as a GeoJSON. And you can also save as a um, uh, GeoParket, also save as a BlobGeoBuff or anything, geo uh, anything that you want. And 
if you don't, um, yeah, yeah, that that's that's it. That's it. Okay, I don't want to bring too much. Okay. Oh, I will receive another information. So what? Also, oh, this is like the the form is too small for you. Maybe I should increase the form. Yeah, I think I can do it from here. Okay. Oh, so actually this polygon or the target site that WWF would like to airdrop uh pen balls. It's penable. Penable. Does anyone know what is penable? No, it's actually one of the games it's called Monster Hunter. So you have to actually locate where your monster is. So you will you will throw the pen and ball to the monster and you will have the, the strain on the monster. So they will go to another map and you can follow in and you can hunt it down. So it's well used in Monster Hunter world. So it's one of like the geolocation tool that we use when we were the child. We use the uh, we we play a video game, we want to locate our our our, our monster and we use this kind of uh, hunter ball loop. So it's use this to, to track the Godzilla and they will try to track the Godzilla and try to figure out what is its natural habitat, which is very important work for WWF to know like this kind of species, like where is it's actually located in somewhere in the in the in the earth. And we are trying to not intervene into their natural habitat to destroy the natural habitat to make like a sedentary for Godzilla. I don't know he's needed to that, but I hope that it will be necessary. So we need to guess. So actually, uh, WWF want to airdrop this kind of uh, panabolu. Panabolu. It's the panball in Japanese. Panabolu. And to 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 locate where is the Godzilla, but but they don't know what exactly the Godzilla will uh, will be after one hour because they 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 set this kind of plant. In, in one hour to to airdrop this kind of panel to some of the location which is show on this show on this so to know that uh, they were locating somewhere on the earth which is possible you can capture our Godzilla because WWF didn't didn't receive like the information from CIA so they can't really track the information from you come from the data from CIA so so then they, they asked us to do like uh, if they can really um, target on our Godzilla or not. So let's see if WWF will succeed to, to, to get a tracker on our Godzilla. So first, we can make the uh, prediction based on the former information we have. So like an hour ago, they moved from the, okay, they moved from like the, the, the course line for the Peru to the, the, the west north of the Peru. So we can assume like the simple assumption they will move to the same uh, direction and on in the same speed. So we can use our geolocation, like the two geolocation, like the first geolocation we get and the second geolocation we get and calculate the differences. And we found out this is the differences. They will move to um, 0 0.01 degree. Uh, they will gain 0 0.01 degree for uh, lo longitude and Minus zero point zero one degree to for the the the, the long the the altitude yeah. Yeah, they will be yeah, complicated the 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 stuff. Uh, yeah, probably you have, if you want to like make this uh, the prediction more solid, and it is necessary to to recruit a team to do this kind of uh, GIS tracking stuff. But yeah, we just. Building a basis on function, it's yeah. Now this this now what we got, but it's a good point. We should we should probably like consider more uh, factors. So yeah, let's keep going. So if if the gorilla swim to the same direction in the same speed, we, we can assume that it will gain one more um, longitude and lose one more altitude in that in this case. So it will be at the place that we can actually calculate it, and we can plot it out based on the method we have. So we have a prediction of our Godzilla. So it's not a, like a solid machine learning model, but just a, a very simple guess. Okay. So you can also open on the QGIS, but I don't, I just skip that. 
Yeah, you can open up the QGIS. You can see it will be somewhere like the laptop. And now we're gonna to, what we're gonna to do is who know what we're gonna to do in this case. Yeah. Anyone knows like what is the right way to 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 see if the the the, the planet volu airdrop on the Godzilla? Yeah. Oh good. So no one. No, I know I will I will unveil. So basically we can use the methods called over the uh, uh over overlay. So we have the uh we have our uh polygon of our panel ball loop, which which place they will airdrop to. And also we have our location of uh, a prediction of a location of a Godzilla. So we basically just overlap the factor data with the raster data, and we can see that if they are actually overlay overlay. So yeah, so the basic calculation we can use a feature. We can we can use feature to map. Okay, I just ran it wrong. And you can see the picture on the map, which is here. And to see we can plot it together. Our mask just based on oh, it's like the we factorize the factor data, sorry, we factorize our factor data into uh uh, a same bounding box as our raster data, which is have the 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 Godzilla in the middle, is which is the it's a it's a it's a matrix. It's a raster data that have the bounding box and the geolocation, and we use the information to have factorize our factor data on it. So we can see as we factorize, we can see this kind of three places are the the panel will well allocate on our raster data set. And so then we can overlap with our Godzilla. So, oh, you can see from here on Godzilla, actually one panel volu will hit on the Doris of our Godzilla and other two will miss. But it means that we have like a chance to actually uh, locate our Godzilla. Congratulations, WWF. Yeah, you can see from the image. The, di the the diagram and uh, uh, diamond shape of the panel ball will airdrop our uh, Godzilla uh, Doris plates if our prediction is right. So, congratulations, we will can locate our Godzilla. Do you have? Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Try my best. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. So we can also like uh, to find where's the where's the place of our Godzilla, how how big of the how big part of the Godzilla will be uh will be strained by the panel ball loop. So you can see the image, the Dorans will be uh colored by the colorized by the panel ball loop. And finally we can make uh, the estimating percent of our Godzilla to which will be getting strained. So we calculate it. Um yeah, like based on our prediction and our um manipulation in our Python, and we can calculate we can conclude that 4.1, 4.61 part of Godzilla body will just the storing part, small part 4.61 will be strained by the Godzilla. So yeah, so that is a basic uh, Python uh Python. Uh, GI Python set base build data analysis uh, uh, tutorial. So, anyone have the the question? And probably anyone had to add on something about their their experience with Godzilla. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and also have the bonus lectures. So, what, how many times we have? Well, fifth, thirteen minutes. So we will skip this part. And yeah, and we go to like the, the next part. And so, yeah, I finished my, my hand on experience, hand on the exercise very quick. I hope that you guys can play around back home and also to, to see like, how can we better to, to, to geolocate our Godzilla based on this. It's not only like linear, linear movement, but also a lot of geo, in, um, geo information should, should be considered. But uh, yeah, um, to our finish our uh, 
to tutor, I wanted to introduce the last part, which is back to some serious work. So uh, to to back to our, the part is called the strip uh, stripping to production work. Um, did anyone uh, have done some production work here? Uh, well, how how to define a production work? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, and I will start about start from this. So this is one of the 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 project I have worked on is uh, in open uh, open Earth monitor. We wanted to develop one of the assemble uh, digital elevation map based on like multi source of the digital elevation map and also the the canopy height to know um, to know the to to map like the global digital uh, elevation map in Terran's point of view. So if you, you, you do you guys are familiar with uh, D DEM, something someone familiar with that? Like cop DEM and okay, you one, two. Yeah, okay. I think some of them are really familiar with that. And now with our, our DEM, which is have a more we will have multi-source of DEM. Uh, we have Co uh, Copernicus, we have Alice, we have Mer DDM, and in our organization, we also have like some um, regional D D D D D D D D E E M, and the D E M have different type. We have D S M, it's more like a surface model, which is we will capture the trees and the building, and we also have D T M, which is more capture like the bare soil. So D T M is mainly like useful for like hy hydrological analysis. And in this workflow, we just I just want to demonstrate that we can uh, build up the workflow based on based on most multiple uh, D DTM, and we uh, do some um, data manipulation for 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 it based on your DT DSM or DTM, and you use this kind of a basic algorithm to extract the the lowest part of our. The uh, most of our DDM and to to get our DTM. So which is this is our, like our basic workflow. So basically the uh, Copernicus and the Alice and they are DSM. So which is like we're, we're not, we 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 will capture the tree the canopy high. So we want we don't want the canopy high because we wanted to generate our DTM like a global DTM. We have a lot of global DSM, but we don't have global. Like the, the the best global DTM yet we have five them but that that yet but yeah so so basic uh operation we will use our canopy high to to filter out which is the part the the DSM have the the tallest canopy high the the, the canopy high which uh, over two and also to generate like a standard deviation amount different uh digital elevation maps. And if the standard deviation too high, it means that how they predict this kind of area will be, will be also differences. So it means that you probably have trees over there to have the influence on, um, so to, to get the, the ground truth. So we use this kind of information to filter out and we aggregate to our 10% lower quantile and to get to generate our, our, our output of our bare earth like digital Terran's model and our uncertainty. And the workflow is maybe not the important in this course. And the most important is like, you can see that the workflow, you, if you have the workflow, you can actually understand that what we're gonna to do, what we're gonna to process the data, what we're gonna to like uh, generate a statistic based on, the, based on our former data. And then we get to like the final result and we store it in somewhere. So that is the, the main concept I wanted to share. So if you have the concept of work and you can generate this kind of workflow and go from the rope data to the end of the data set. So you can see, you can write some script to, okay, generate some of first certain, certain step in the script, just like you are using Jupyter Notebook and you, you execute line by line and you're writing the script line by line. They will follow the, the order of the script to, to get the, the final result. So it's called scripting. So you actually make the, the script and the, the program will understand, will execute your screen from the first line to the, the last line based on your language like Python, R, is, or like this kind of scripting language, they will uh, execute line by line to the end. Um, probably some of you will ask, well, so what is actually the Python script? 
and Jupyter Notebook script. So, so yeah, I think most of the people here are using Jupyter Notebook for analyze, right? So you are familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the main difference between like Python script and uh, Python script in Jupyter Notebook is like Python script is more mainly used as module and it's executable in your terminal and it's better for documentation. And for the, the Python script, uh, the, for the Jupyter Notebook script, it's mainly used like uh, analyst and it's more interactive and it's good for presentation. So basically that is why most of the lead vector they will use Jupyter Notebook to ex execute their, 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 their script. So that is the main difference. Um, what is uh, what? Why scripting is so important? So you can see from the graph. So you can imagine like now we have the this kind of and some and, and D D D N. We can also use our QGIS to to get all of the map together, and we calculate the statistic, and then we output the model, export our map from our QGIS. But you you always see that there are some obstacles, like you cannot reading the whole data set, you cannot reading the whole global map and execute at the same time. And you have to manually click. So okay, I wanted to choose this map, I want to drag this map, and then you you click 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 and you get your result. And the the script is like you have the input, and you can even like make a make a schedule, like schedule your your script time, or you can just executing your terminal and they will do like the manual work, like the same manual work like QGIS can do inside the script. And you will get the result, uh, uh, you will get a result based on what, you, what you're scripting. So it's mainly just turn your manual work in QGIS. You can, you can imagine like turn your manual work into like automatic work. If that work will not change for, uh, for, um, different cases, for example. So I put in here is like my routine work. I have the, for example, you have the repetitive work. You have to execute, you have to make the same map every day based on QGIS. And you can use like Python script to write this kind of code. And you just execute it every time because you don't change your workflow. So stripping ultimate task for, I uh, used to ultimate task for web a website and web application. And now it's more uh, applicable for analyze, uh, analyze when you are doing uh, uh, repetitive task or, and now you can also do in huge data processing task. And what is the, the benefits of, uh, of scripting here is also one part of them. It's, uh, it could be fully re, uh, reper reproducible delivery. So you have the, you have the script, so you you actually can publish your script well, well with your publication, and the script that tell the people like how did you make your data? I mean, you, you made the map, but you don't tell like people how to make that kind of map. But this script is possible to to generate the to to show that uh, that is how I execute uh, our data to get our map, and it could be very useful for other people to reproduce your work. So, yep. Um, I put in one of the um, uh, publication here is called uh, the five star guide to encourage more research and GIS uh, participants to share the data and code. It's probably based on the, the concept that we have, like the one star concept, we have public repository and we have open license. And then we document our metadata better and then we structure and we, we use open format. And the four star, we have a uh, geospatial standard. And the five star, we can use uh, a Docker and to, to actually uh, wrap up our environments. So that people can just, people can use this kind of uh, environment to reproduce the work. So it's very important for uh, our researchers to to do, to just generate reproducible research, and also uh, yesterday I heard about the DVC. It's also good for. Uh, so I just heard about that, so I just put in here today. Is I think it's a good way to actually uh, vision vision your 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 data, so they can be 
this can be built upon that to be more reproducible like a research. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's think that I talk about back 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 to talk about our script. So I talk about if, if you do like rep rep repetitive work, you can use a script. And if you use uh if you have the huge data set, this kind of uh, scripting is also helpful. So in the real production, uh we are trying to it's uh, how many uh, like five minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two okay. Minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so in the real production, uh, we have this kind of the huge data set. And I, I think I, I should skip this kind of this part. So so the script is like you can it can possibly execute like a small tile and to generate the, the result. And we can divide our, our earth into like a lot of our tiles. And we can all do the same algorithm if you don't have uh uh like a correlation between tiles and tile, we can just execute it independently to get the, the final result. So the question is, um, now you can use the script to, to re repetitively generate this kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the tiles to generate, to, to process every tile. But if one tile takes uh, 10 seconds, how long will it take to finish? So we have like 21,000 of tiles for the whole world. If I, if I, if I tile I'll, 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 like this. So basically 10 multiplied by 21,000, 210,000 and divide by uh, minutes and hours. And we will spend like six, 602 hours to, 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 to finish all the tile. If you have this big amount of tile and we estimate it will be 10, 10 seconds to finish. And it will be about like um, how many how many days? Uh, 25. Like tw twenty five days. Yeah, twenty five days. So it's not gonna work twenty five days if you just process the, the 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 map. So we have also we have our computer infrastructure to to paralyze this kind of work. We we learned about some paralyzation in from the former lecture, but this is like uh, we build in in Open Geo Hub we build the paralyzation. It's not based on the processor, it's also based on the server. So we actually have a search, uh, like it's, a, it's called the HPC job scheduler, it's called Slurm. And we use Slurm to, we use, we use to Slurm to distribute the, the, the task to different server and different server parallelized by themselves. So we have uh, each server, we have hundred, like about 100 of processor, we have 13 servers, so we have like, more than thousand of processor you can to 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 execute one script. Yep. The yeah. So the basic workflow will be like this. So everything uh, run in parallel. Yeah. And lastly, uh, I just want to share that we have. Uh, uh, so what with the, the the work we based on we are doing about the cloud 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 solution about the uh, analyze ready data about this kind of uh, computing infrastructure is. Uh, it's highly related to our open the smart the cyber infrastructure, this project, OEMC. And we, we, in this project, we're trying to make the data more accessible. We try to uh, make the metadata more consistent to generate uh, analyzed ready data for any different use cases. So please, that's, uh, I don't think I will skip the, uh, skip, skip the takeaway. And we will have the workshop, so. If you're interested in that, you can learn more than that, more than what I say, what I te what I taught today. So, yeah, thank you. Just one announcement. This is 